it's setting up. Well, it says we're live and let's make sure it's recording. Liam, I don't see the record button and uh, so uh, there we go. Hello, hello everyone, welcome. It's Tuesday, it's Facebook Live, it's four o'clock Pacific, five o'clock here in Costa Rica, seven o'clock on the East Coast of Boston where our guest is from this evening. 1 a.m. in Italy, Wednesday morning, and 8.30 and 9.30 a.m. Wednesday morning in Australia, depending on what part of Australia you're in. So welcome, it's Facebook Live. And as always, I'm going to see if I can bring up Facebook Live on my phone so that I can see who's here. So let me know, let us know that you're out there. You know, give a little shout out and tell us where you're from. Uh, it always makes my day to see. Oh, there we go. Hey, I did this without Marzi. I actually brought this up correctly without Marzi. There's Alice in Virginia. Thank you so much, Alice. You're the first. Way to go. Way to go. Here comes Dorada in New York. Dorada, welcome back, as always. And the list will go on and on. So our guest today, I am really excited about this, that um, I haven't really had the chance yet to meet in person with Dr. Uma Naidu. No, that's not true. We did meet one time. We did it meet. Was very yeah. Quick. Yeah. It was it very is quick. quick. But, but yes. yeah, it doesn't uh, but, uh, her, her husband is a, is a friend of mine, a good friend of mine. But Dr. Naidu is um, um, a world-class scientist. And when I say that, I don't say that lightly, that she is the, I'm gonna read this to make sure I get it right. She directs the first hospital-based nutritional psychiatry service in the United States. Happens to be at Mass General at Harvard, right? And she's the director and the founder of it. She's the director of nutritional psychiatry at Mass General. And she also is on teaching faculty at Harvard Medical School. So we have a world-class scientist with us today. Dr. Nadu, welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Tom. It's lovely to be here. And thank you for that warm welcome. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, so let's just dive into it. Our audience has heard me talk about many, many times the concept that the number of messages coming from the brain going down to the gut is nowhere near the number of messages from the gut going up to the brain. Can we start there with a little more information on that topic? Sure, it's, it, and I'm sure that um, people that you've spoken with before know this connection, but I think what's important from my perspective as a psychiatrist is that you know uh, my, my patients know that they should be eating for better blood pressure control and you know to improve their diabetes or obesity, but if you make the connection that what we eat is also related to mental health, then it really comes down to the gut. One of the things um, I think about it uh, as sort of a two-directional two or bi-directional superhighway where, where chemicals are moving up and down all the time, but also um, more than 90% of the serotonin receptors for the happiness hormone um, on, upon which many medications are based uh, actually are in the gut. So when, when, when people understand that, it's also therefore easy to understand that food will be impacted just by being in that environment. And therefore, what you eat um, could be a good thing. It could be a, a, a healthy uh, option or it could be an unhealthy option. May, you know, I, so ask you, yeah, may I ask you a little more about that? Yeah. So when someone um, is suffering from depression, and they go to their doctor and they recommend an antidepressant, which may be the right thing to do. When they take that medication, it actually primarily is targeted and directed at the gut. That it's not, that pill is not going up to the brain. Uh, no, so, so, so it, it does have effects on the gut and I'll tell you why. The effects on the gut are often the side effects. So many people who start a medication such as an SSRI will have gastrointestinal side effects to start. The chemical and neurochemical effect is on the brain, but it does get confusing because the serotonin receptors are contained in the gut. So we are always targeting the brain, but I think the missing, the missing piece for us has been that food also impacts this interaction. 
then why is it that we look at medical illness and inflammatory diseases and you know bowel disease and all sorts of things and we we understand there are things we should do with our diet but why is it that we don't do it for mental health and that's really has been the focus of my work for some time um and you know it, it's uh I, I think when when you when you unpack it for people and you really see what they've been eating, you can then make links to some of the symptoms that they've started to experience. And you know, Dr. Tom, we're not talking about someone who's seriously depressed, who is suicidal or manic or psychotic, where they might need to be in the hospital. They might immediately need medication care just to stabilize them. But at all of these points, nutrition can be a part of it. But in those instances, it wouldn't be the first line of care. Now, uh, I'm going to go back because I'm a little bit geeky on this, and I oh, really yeah. want to understand it. Yes. If we have 90% of our serotonin receptors in the gut, mm -hmm. does that suggest that the serotonin is produced and stored in our gut, a, a large portion of it? So it's mostly, uh, mostly manufactured in the brain. But Most it may act, brand. exactly, exactly. And I, I know that is actually a, a very important and confusing point at times. But I think that the, the message that sort of, that, that I try to convey to, to the individuals I work with is that the gut microbiome research has shown the, the bugs in our gut that are helping us, that are the good and the bad guys. But, the, but you can actually change the, the structure or the nature of what those bugs are within the course of 24 hours. You may not feel the effect immediately. The effect, in fact, is more long-term. But if you think about that for a second, if, if I eat a bag of potato chips tonight and pizza and ice cream, that's gonna have an impact on my gut within 24 hours. And my gut bacteria could change. And at the same time, if I have a healthier option meal, it could change in a good direction. So I think that that's another piece of sort of useful information for people to know because our gut microbiome, the, 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 the number of bacteria and what the bacteria are is mostly unique for, for all of us. And I think that that, you know, is sometimes helpful for people. To That's understand. very helpful. And what that suggests to me is that every choice we make to eat something that we know is better for us mm -hmm. is going to have an accumulative effect exactly. in our gut. Exactly. which means it will have an accumulative effect on our brains. Exactly. Which exactly. means it's going to have a cumulative benefit on how we think. Uh, cognition, means, absolutely. That, that's that's well said. Happier. Yes, exactly. we're or, going to be or happier. Karma, you know, or we'll, be, we'll have less brain fog or, you know, that, and yeah. I've, seen, I've seen this happen with people. So let me do a shout out here to Helen in Australia and Steph is in Missouri, Drew's in Jersey. Joyce is in Portland, Dwin's back again. Hi, Dwin. Nydia's here from Spring, Texas. And guys, you're all welcome to send in some questions here. Mia's here from North Wales. Thank you, Mia. Joanne in Pennsylvania. And the list goes on and on, and I'll say more about them. Oh, just a minute. I have read a book called Nutritional Solutions by David Rowland, and he says, quote, craving for a specific food are very often caused by allergy to that food. Allergy and addiction are, in effect, two sides of the same coin, end quote. I have chocolate, but find that I get irritable or anxious after I eat it. Perhaps I'm allergic to it. Any thoughts? Dr. Uma, what, what would you think? So chocolate is an interesting um, is an interesting substance, and I'm not sure if if this gentleman is is allergic or not, because usually an allergic reaction in the body has more of an extreme effect, and it can also have a mild effect, and they're sort of very specific symptoms that someone may have. But I think he's using the term more generally in terms of, you know, whether he maybe doesn't tolerate it well, and. And I think with chocolate, you know, it has so many positive effects, but it also depends on the kind of chocolate, right? We're not talking the, the uh, sugar-filled candy bars, which, which do taste good, but you know, they're not an everyday treat. Um, we're really talking about super dark chocolate, uh, usually more than 70%, the more pure form with natural cacao. Why do I say that? Because the antioxidant level is higher, better for your brain, and the process of how pure chocolate is manufactured and uh, the, the process in, in, in which it comes to be the chocolate we, we understand and eat is actually fermented, which is good for our gut. Um, 
I think that the difficulty is that there may be some caffeine in it, uh, just from from the the process of of of, um, of the chocolate, and there might also be added sugars. So it depends very much on the chocolate itself that you're eating. And I would start there to try to understand it, and I would try to see what the effects are and if they remain the same. Now the other other point he mentioned was about addictions, and an interesting study was done where. And it has been replicated where, you know, the, 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 the parts of our brain that are impacted by, um, by addictive substances are also impacted and also light up when, um, when sugar is involved in our food. So that's another, uh, I guess, indicated to us that, uh, you know, eating highly sugared foods may not be the best to our, for our brain, but also it may have a potentially somewhat addicting effect. Um, sorry, everybody, we're experiencing technical difficulties. This is Liam. I run Dr. Tom's Facebook Lives. Um, he is in Puerto Rico. Um, that's not the right country. He's not in America, so his Wi-Fi is not fantastic. So let me find out what's going on. I'm so sorry, Dr. Uma. Please keep no talking. Problem. Though. No, As no you can problem. see, a lot of people have come to listen to. Right, right. Saying. No, I'll, I'll just continue on the gut and the brain. So, you know, I, the way that I share... Um, sort of how to to best reset one's uh, let's say one's gut. If you if for example you haven't been eating the healthiest diet, I think that it's it's always a great place to start with some basic building blocks and healthy habits. And one of those ways is to increase the fiber in your diet. And we get fiber really from uh, the most natural sources from uh, vegetables, from fruit, from beans, legumes, nuts, and seeds. And I'm talking about sort of the healthier versions of these. And these these foods provide uh, fiber to the gut and the gut bacteria really thrive um, with, the, with the fiber. So you, you, you're eating foods that are going to move your gut balance or your gut microbiome in a really positive direction um, that only benefits your physical health as well as your mental health. Um, but, but by the same token, eating foods that are processed, um, have a lot of added sugars. And a lot of people don't realize that um, savory foods have a ton of added sugars in them. And so things like salad dressings or ketchup, um, even tomato sauces that someone might have with a whole grain pasta, often have quite a lot of added sugars. Um, so it's not just the things we think of as sweet that are uh, the only sweetened items in our grocery cabinet or in our supermarkets. So what I like to say to people is, you know, understand what the ingredients are in the food that you're eating, because I think the other part of what we've tried to do in my book is really talk about foods that uh, a person should embrace for different, as uh, for certain illness, and but also uh, foods that they should avoid. Um, so some of the things, you know, that people should be trying to stay away from, and it's sometimes hard to do all of these things at the same time. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's difficult enough to change a habit, but I ask people to start with a small, healthy habit that they feel they can, they can adhere to, because once they get used to it and they see the positive benefits of that healthy habit, they tend to want to do it in an ongoing way. So, you know, for one person, it was, you know, not although she was trying to eat a healthy diet and, and we had to tweak that to some extent, she wasn't drinking enough water. And hydration is so vitally important to the way our organs function, to the way that substances in our body function, but also to our diet, to, to how we digest our food. Um, and it wasn't the only thing that we did, but it was one of the things that stuck out as um, uh, something that was helpful for her to do um, as well. Liam, I'm not sure if you can read the questions. I'm not able to see the questions. Hi there. Dr. Naidu, how Hi. are you? Good, how are you? I'm super excited that Dr. O'Brien was able to do this with you. We, oh, yeah. We love your book. We read little oh, pieces of it and oh, yeah. Thank you. Awesome. I, no, no problem at all. Yeah, I, um, if you, if, if I, can't, I can't see the questions from where I am. But Absolutely. I'm happy to do some. 
Yeah. Dr. O'Brien had, just for everybody to know, Dr. O'Brien had a power outage. Uh-uh. So he asked if we could step in. And I said, I know Dr. Naidu very well. I love her work. So uh, I'm happy you. to step in and continue the interview. So yes, we have many more g- great questions. Did you answer the question about how to increase glutathione and GABA production naturally? Um, I didn't. You know, I think that the the way I would, I usually try to make recommendations through food. Um, so it's it's difficult to to break it down in terms of you know GABA is is a neurochemical and that type of stuff. But what we've done is we've tried to provide um, food sources of the different of the different. Uh, you know, natural substances that are in your body to help you out. Because I think the difficulty uh, and and in nutritional psychiatry, I try to recommend foods before I recommend uh, a supplement. I understand that they're extremely important, but we try to put those first. And then we we mention other things in the book that that are in the food list that you could. Well, can we talk also about um, absorption, because I know that mm-hmm. you can go to a supplement, but so many things are much more well absorbed if you eat them in your food than if you Versus. take them in a supplement. Absolutely. So for example, you know, a good example um, uh, would be you can, you can take a, um, you can take omega-3 supplements. And, you know, they'll do your body good. And some people prefer to do it that way. But you can also eat well-sourced, um, you know, sockeye salmon. And you can also, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> like that. Um, and you can also include some plant-based options of where you can get a version of omega-3. It's not as, as well-absorbed um, in, in the brain, but you still get some source of it. So it's not as though you're missing out on it completely. Um, and also, you know, you want to think about things like some of what I talk about, uh, or some of the principles I include are things like eat an orange, because we talk about whole healthy foods, which I know your audience is, is used to hearing from Dr. Tom and familiar with. But, you know, eat the orange instead of the orange juice, because you would miss all the fiber from the orange juice, and you don't get the nutrients as much um, in, in that form. But, but and all the blood sugar. Exactly. And then, you know, you with orange juice, that's especially store-bought, you have so many added sugars that it's really not, not worth it. Um, so it's the, the actual way in which it's processed, but then it becomes the added sugar. So why not eat the orange, you know? And, and of course, fruit is, is always an important question because there are um, fruits that have a high glycemic index and, and those that are, have a better glycemic index. And the ones that we tend to go to are the berries because they tend to be healthier options for us. <laughs> and they have good antioxidants as well as other nutrients. Good for you. Dr. Tom talks about a half a cup of blueberries every day that can, within six or eight weeks, or maybe six or eight months, I don't remember, really elevate your brain functionality. Absolutely, because you have a powerful, um, you know, the polyphenols, the antioxidants in the blueberries are super helpful. You know, it's interesting because when we talk about uh, phytonutrients, they're probably um, in in plant and uh, veg, in plant foods, and we talk about you know eating the color of the rainbow and eating colorful foods. Why do we say that? Because it's the phytonutrients, it's the carotenoids from carrots, it's the um, bright um, you know the bright purple hues of say whether it's eggplant or a, a type of cabbage or whatever it is. So those ty- those are those are what we're encouraging people to eat all in moderation and as part of a healthy diet because the the biodiversity of the foods you eat in the, um, especially in the plant foods, create a biodiversity for your gut microbiome. So it's, you know, there's a, in other words, the more, the more colors that you eat, the more different types of healthy fruits and vegetables that you eat, um, just, just adds to the, the, the differentiating factors within your gut to, to feed your gut bacteria with the biodiversity of different foods. Dr. Naidu, would you walk us through a day in the life of Dr. Naidu's family? What does uh, what does breakfast, lunch, dinner, and a healthy snack look like if we were in your family? You are so learned and knowledgeable. Well, 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 firstly, you know, let me just say that none of us is perfect. So certainly during these times of um, a different kind of stress and different types of things going on, I certainly don't have the perfect diet, but I, but I try. I mean, I, I try to make uh, the healthy habits stick. 
One of the things I, I try to be good about is I'm good about hydration because I really think it's made a difference. I'm not just talking about we having a particularly warm spell in Boston and enjoying it, but I but I always almost always carry uh, my my little glass water bottle wherever I can go um, because that becomes important in how say you're taking medications. It's important for that too. But then you know I, I like to switch out breakfast. I like to do things with the, one of the new recipes I've been working on is kind of using um, using things like chickpeas and different lentils to create a different kind of an omelet. You know, so you can you can have a, a, an egg white omelet and actually eggs tend to be pretty uh, rich in melatonin. So sometimes I tell my patients to have that at the evening as a, as a dinner option menu because it can oh. actually help, might help sleep. And then um, the yolk is on them. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So, so I have a few, a few different favorites. I try to do things... Um, um, I try to meal prep and the reason is because work is busy. So if I have something ready to go, it's easier. So I love chia pudding. Um, it's rich in fiber. It's rich in protein. Um, I add. Um, and that recipe low... is in your book, isn't it? it exactly. This, I, I believe it is in the book. And if it isn't, we put it online somewhere. I remember recently. So, um, and I, and I, uh, you know, I don't really use much to sweeten it. In fact, it, it I've gotten used to the coconut milk bringing out a sweetness. And then I add fruit toppings. I add berries. Um, I add walnuts. Um, I like to throw in some flax seeds, um, you know, because that's just an additional boost for your brain. Why not? A, little, a couple of hemp seeds. And then the crunch is fun too, you know, even some dark chocolate chips if I'm feeling decadent for my breakfast. But the thing about chia pudding is that it's super it's filling. It's filling and it's full of fiber and protein are the two leading nutrients. Mm -hmm. um, and what I find is that a small serving does me good for, you know, keeps me full and comfortable and happy. And I, I love a cup of coffee in the morning. Um, and then, you know, snacks, I, I, try to, I try to keep snacks that are just easy to package and carry. So, you know, I love things like the thing, a lot of things that people know already. I, but here are my tweaks. So I might I might have a whole lot of cut veggies, but how I make the hummus is that I add in my super spice of turmeric and black pepper. And, you know, it, yes, it gives it that beautiful hue, but I know that the turmeric is anti-inflammatory anti exactly it's anti-inflammatory it's antioxidant it does so many good things even some recent studies have shown it to have an antiviral effect so you know all, all you really need is about a quarter teaspoon a day with a pinch of black pepper so you know why why not do that and if i say to people if you don't cook with it add it to you know smoothie add it to a um a soup uh you know put, put if, if that's if you don't say do a stir fry with it so I uh, put that in my house. So I know I have that on hand. And the other thing I love to, uh, for those, those people, who, those of you who make homemade hummus, you add a little bit of tahini paste. The sesame seeds are good for you because it's made from sesame and those are good for your brain. And it's a little bit of sesame seed um, in the tahini made, that makes up the tahini paste. So that's, but then I have another neat trick for my hummus. So I try to get in as many nutrients in that. I add a little bit of avocado for extra creaminess. Oh, nice. So when you blend it up, it actually ends up being super creamy and it, it's super, you know, you know, it's enjoyable with uh, cut veggies and that kind of stuff. So I try to have a little batch in the fridge for that. For salad, I like to have a, um, I, 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 I really love a big salad and, and basically starting with, you know, all of your greens, different, as many different varieties. For example, recently I was excited. I got pea tendrils. I was like, wow, you know, that's not something I get often in, in, in Boston, but we were able to get some from a farm and they would lovely, um, you know, sweet, greens that you added in with your arugula, which has that somewhat, you know, slightly peppery um, crunch to it and, you know, kale and whatever it is. So I have this huge base for the salad. And then I add in this. Do you eat raw kale? I had heard from Franz Sussman to always mm -hmm. parboil my kale and throw away the water because of the oxalates. Right. So I actually, so when I put kale in my salad, I don't put much of it. It's not the entire salad. I put a few, but my favorite, my favorite recipe for kale is actually kale chips. So, so oven roasted kale chips is a great sort of crunchy 
snack that is so easy to do. And the only only tip about it that I have is you've got to eat it pretty soon after you're making it, because if not, they kind of wilt. Um, and, and then I build up the salad based on as many colorful veggies as I can add. I can use, you know, any type of protein, um, depending on, on what, what the family wants in particular. And, and I think that that way, you know, a squeeze of lemon on your salad, some zest of lemon is all you need, a little bit of salt and pepper. You can also make up, you know, three ingredient vinaigrette and, and have that in a bottle for the week because it's, it'll save you on not only calories, it's, you can use a healthy homemade olive oil. And you're going to be able to really use that for the rest of the week. In the afternoon, I tend to have a piece of um, piece of fruit, either, you know, some sort of sort of citrus fruit. I've tried to, to incorporate more citrus fruit in this time. Um, that and if I'm feeling I have a little bit of a, uh, a sweet craving in the afternoon, I love to pair a piece of citrus fruit with super dark chocolate. Uh, because I find that something about, well, firstly, from baking, I love to bake. And the, the, the dark chocolate and the citrus has a great flavor to it. My mouth so started watering that's, that's thinking exactly, about it. You know, because it's that sweet, you get a sweet piece of clementine and the dark chocolate, they do that. And, um, you know, there's always some cut veggies around if I'm hungry. And then in the, in the evening, it really is much of what I, what I, what we, we feel up for. So it could be, it could be, you know, a seafood uh, dish. I, I tend to eat more plant-based options. So for me, it would be, you know, a cauliflower steak, but here's how I change it up. I'll use, you know, tandoori spices on a cauliflower steak mm -hmm. or, and so, you know, uh, again, just changing it up so that it's interesting and adding other, um, other greens or other vegetables that go with it. I and I just I find it filling. Yeah. I want to ask the team if they put the link to the book in the Facebook thread. Okay. So hold on one sec, because I'm going to holler. Is, okay. the, is the link to that? Yeah. Can you put it in the Facebook thread for us? Thank you. No, no criticism, but thank you. Because thank you so I just want to say to everyone that, you know, the opportunity to um, participate with a Harvard educated, amazing chef and scientist like Dr. Uma Naidu does not come oh, often. You. She's one of my favorite people in our community. And, you know, a book is a way to participate so intimately with the most learned people in our okay. society. So this book, I believe in my heart is a gateway, not only to better nutrition, but to a better life. This book is like, you know, devote yourself to this book for even three weeks and mm -hmm. you'll bring nutrition into your family and into your body in a whole new way. And you'll see the changes like your, your joints, somebody had written in about her joints were hurting. Yeah, like yeah. that is one of the first mm -hmm. symptoms that mm -hmm. goes away when you get mm -hmm. into what Dr. Naidu is teaching. And she's mm -hmm. teaching it in such a, a, an absorbable, easily understood, the vernacular is brought down to our level, regular people. So, I mean, you, you've done, I think, the miraculous in bringing this very high idea down to my kitchen, the normal person. Oh, thank you. So, that, thank you so much for saying that. You know, thank you. It's, I, appreciate, I appreciate that so much. You know, it's hard to translate science, right? And I yeah. think that, 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 and the reason I say that is so if my patients come in and they're confused by what they're reading in the media, what the latest, um, the, the latest sort of article is saying about food and what should they include and, and what's good for them. So to help break it down for people and to create the food lists, um, you know, is, is, is sometimes helpful. And it's interesting that one of the things my patients brought to my attention was the fact that they want to know what to avoid as well. You know, they're oh, always that excited. Came up in the, that just came up in the questions too. It, exactly. It, 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 it's interesting because what, the, what they love uh, consistently is how much they can eat um, because there's so many <laughs> varieties of things and there's so many healthy options if they just know how to put it together and they get some ideas. Um, and because our microbiome is, is uh, each of us is, is somewhat unique, you know, they're, they're, I, over time I've evolved for the work and the treatment plans for nutrition to be more unique as well for that individual based on what they might like to eat. But, um, you know, I think that uh, it, it, it's really about find, finding the balance and finding um, things that, that you want to include. You know, for example, people, um, May, may take lunch meats and a sandwich to go to work, or, or it may be something that people are using for school lunches. Well, the, the whole thing about processed meats um, in that way um, are that they many times include nitrates, and nitrates have been linked to depression. 
So you you know oh. might be loaded with sodium and things like that. But those are the 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 you know that those are some of the things we sort of unpacked in the research that we did. And the nitrates are not helpful to you. They're not helpful to your brain. The only um, you know advantage I think I think one of the studies showed that if if it was paired with buckwheat in that as as part of that ingredient it may be slightly better but you know i would say the way i frame it for people is have a treat day every week i truly sincerely believe this i don't like my patients to deprive themselves unless they have an allergy or they can't tolerate something i want them to have a day of the week for one person it could be a tuesday for another it could be saturday night but to enjoy something that they is their favorite and maybe they rotate during the month on 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 tasting their favorites rather than excluding it because if they do there's often a boomerang effect and they just go back to eating it and then they eat it in an unhealthy way. So I think that that whole thing about restricting foods is very hard for people. Um, uh, I know I find that hard. So if I'm trying to eat healthier, you know, having more healthy snacks on hand that I can get my hands on instead of the cookies and the, and the stuff that if it's there, you know, I, I might wander into that cabinet and get them. So I think managing your well, environment is this is very important. It's what you said to me when we met in, met in Manhattan so long ago yeah. when you started yeah. this book. It was yeah. moving from restrictive foods to prescriptive foods. Absolutely. You have a great memory. You have such a great memory. Yeah. I remember we talked about um, sweet potatoes and that being a complex I never carbohydrate. A good of yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. co co you know, complex carbohydrate and it and by breaking down more slowly, it evens out your blood sugar and it's not, you know, up and down. So it actually helps you really balance your mood as well. Um, so, and it's vegetables. Well, I think, I think this book is, uh, you know, it's like the $5,000 education boiled down to the, the $20 investment <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> the, to the tips that you want to give people. Experience. Is there a, is there a course or a train? One of our people wrote in to ask if there's a course or a training that goes with the book. No, so it's, that's a great question. And thank you for asking it. You know, that's in development. We're really trying to think of what would be um, the best fit for the book. Um, and it's become apparent from the questions we're getting, like that one, that people want to know more. So so it's definitely something that, um, but if people are, so we you know, know us, you know what we promise we'll let everyone know when Dr. Yes. Naidu has this a little further along in development and they will let you guys be the first ones to know because she and Dr. Tom are good friends, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, right, right now we are trying to sort of get, get people to hear about our work and, and know the book uh, during, during the times when so many things are shut down. So I appreciate that. And I think there's a lot of directions from feedback like this that we can, we can move in. I think it's a, a book is so valuable and sometimes so hard to implement, but I want to say to everybody, this book was not hard. This book was step by step, a walkthrough and very understandable and implementable. So give yourself, I'm going to be a little cheerleader for it. Because oh, thank not you. every, That's not so every sweet. book that comes our way is something that I think is implementable to the common person in their kitchen, but this was, and that's because you are a chef. Like you are literally cooking every day. So yes. And, Let me and then the, go, ahead. Uh, so go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say we have more questions. Okay, sure. Uh, let's see. Um, sorry, they're on the other laptop. Here we go. Someone asked about depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. I am interested in hearing what Ni Dr. Naidu has to offer. Well, that's pretty sure. wide open. So I'll just right, let you great. answer. Sure. So I think that um, with anxiety, some of the foods that have been shown to be super helpful to people are um, foods that uh, omega-3 fatty acids, so sources of good, well-sourced fish. Um, the other substances, you know, vitamin D. Um, the third uh, that was shown in studies was um, the addition of turmeric with a pinch of black pepper. And we've talked about this before, I guess the, um, the black pepper activates the curcumin. And I said it earlier in this conversation as well, um, when Dr. Tom was here. So 
those are things that you know you can start to implement the things to kind of stay away from we found a connection between people feeling more anxious even if they didn't have celiac disease but if they were eating gluten so that might be something to consider cutting back on um, if if you have anxiety um, some you know and I think that um, I think it, it becomes about the balance and, and I also want to convey that I speak about it through the lens of nutritional psychiatry, but I really believe in a very holistic and integrated approach. And in the sense that I always like to find the root cause of what might be going on to then for the mental health reason, find out, um, find out what someone needs to do to kind of recalibrate their diet. With depression, I like to start off with um, some basic building blocks. Prebiotic foods feed the good bacteria in our gut, and we need to include them. And they're pretty simple because they're largely the allium family, onions, garlic, leeks, things that we often just add to a lot of daily meals. Those are things that you can do. There are several more. They are uh, leeks, asparagus, um, and uh, jicama, you know, um, Jerusalem artichoke, a lot of stuff jicama. that exactly that have, it's the kind of fiber that they have that make them rich prebiotic foods. I say, you know, if you include them, you, uh, you know, a, ha a happy gut is a happy mood. So if you're feeding your, your gut bacteria with the right foods, you're starting to balance things out for you. And then probiotic rich foods are the ones with the active cultures, such as, you know, um, different types of uh, yogurt, dairy and non-dairy yogurt now have cultures in them, but also uh, fermented foods. So miso, kefir, um, kombucha, uh, pickles, kimchi, that type of stuff. Those are great for your gut. So starting off with those building blocks. And then the next next building block is fiber. And the, the reason that the fiber is important is because feeding, again, feeding your gut with the right foods gets them gets the, the gut bacteria to act in your favor instead of acting against you. So you basically want to have the good guys on your side and you feed them the right foods and, and vegetables, you know, lots of uh, fiber from vegetables and some fruit really helps you with that. So He's back! Awesome. Yay! <laughs> How are you? So, so that's another great stepping stone uh, in terms of building building blocks. But then we have a whole food list, as you've seen in the book, um, at the end of each chapter to to kind of break it down for people. This is, I keep telling everybody, Dr. Tom, this book is the million dollar investment and so worth Thank it you. for the price Thank of you. a bad pizza pie. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm I'm totally going to use that. Thank you. That's, that's a good analogy. That's a very good analogy. I'm going to go off since Dr. Tom is back. I am a poor uh, substitute, but a big fan. So uh, thank you so Bye, much. It's great to see you. Thank you. you. Good Good luck, Dr. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, it's the price of living in the jungle in Costa Rica that sometimes the power goes out. And uh, uh, let me give a shout out, if I may, that um, uh, Nancy's here from Buffalo. Jenny's in Indonesia. Maggie's in Cleveland, uh, Patricia's South Alberta, Andrea's in Fort Myers, and the list, and Tanya's in Perth, and uh, the list goes on and on. So thank That's you. So thank impressive. You. When it, you went through time zones, Dr. Tom, I didn't realize there would be so many people from different time zones. I'm very impressed. Yes, it's really exciting. <laughs> it really motivates me uh, that people from all over the world, you know, yeah. um, we're um, it's a it's a niche, and. Um, it's when you, people don't make a paradigm shift in one day Yes. that we get a little bit of information and a little bit more and a little bit more and we, uh, we kind of wrestle with it. And our group here are people who have like been thinking about this for quite a while. So your book is so appropriate to oh, deal you. with this whole topic of where the vast majority of us are now mm -hmm. in understanding the impact that foods have on our brain and our brain function. It's so critically important. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so a question I was thinking about, I'm, I'm not sure of what you talked about while the monkeys were howling and we didn't <laughs> have any power, but um, Foods that uh, contribute to an anti-inflammatory effect on the brain, did, mm -hmm. did you address that? So no, we didn't necessarily go into anti-inflammatory foods, but we've, we've touched on turmeric a few times in the conversation, and that's an easy fix for, um, you know, for a way to really take something through food that's an anti-inflammatory, really 
it does so many things and um, it, it, it's an easy fix, whether you put it in a, in a, in a soup or a smoothie or whether you cook with it. Um, you know, then, then you want to think about the, the types, the quality and types of the fruit and vegetables that you eat, because those actually help to heal and calm the gut. You know, so those are the sort of big ones that I go to. And the other types of food that I think about, which we, we did cover already, are sort of kind of getting your gut to work for you than against you. And that would be to add back the, the fiber in foods and things like that. Mm -hmm. Marvelous, marvelous, thank you so much. Uh, Tanya, uh, is, it, is it Tanya, just a minute? Sure. Um, ta Tanuja, T-A-N-U-J-A mm -hmm. is in Sydney, Australia. Hello, Tanuja, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. It's the next day um, there, yeah. Yes, yes, it's Wednesday morning there. <laughs> And uh, Brenda's in Kentucky, and Kat's in Kentucky, and Ruthie's in Ohio. And um, having here's a question from Patricia: Having sunshine on as much skin as possible closer to dawn helps with depression. Also, try cutting out gluten completely for eight weeks to assess. Oh, so she's answering a topic, I guess, that was brought up. Um, can can we touch on vitamin D and? Mm -hmm cognitive function and, and depression. Mm -hmm. So, you know, vitamin D has been found to help anxiety. It helped, has been shown to help mood. Um, and the, um, and, and cognitive function is, is a big area. Now, the thing about vitamin D and, and really, for example, we live in the Northeast and, you know, our, our um, sunshine levels are, are definitely probably yeah. leave us a little depleted. But the interesting thing about when you do get sunshine is you have to actually be outside in sunshine. It's not getting sunshine through a clear window or through you know a car. We do a lot of driving in Boston. It's not, that's, that really doesn't help you. So obtaining a natural source of sunshine with the appropriate, you know, whatever your dermatologist has suggested for sunblock or, or sunscreen, but you know, it's, it's really being in sunlight that will, will build up those levels. But then you can also um, do it, you know, uh, take vitamin D in other forms, depending on what your symptoms are. And that's the part that becomes much more of a direct discussion with your doctor because symptoms vary. It may not be the first line of treatment for your anxiety. It might be that you put together a food plan to help with that. Yes, yes. It's, and in our opinion, it's critically important to monitor vitamin D levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, if there was one test, just one blood test you were going to do every year to measure your health, most people say cholesterol, and I would disagree with that. I think it's important to check your cholesterol levels, but your vitamin D level, mm -hmm. because there are so many functions in your body that, that require that it, vitamin D. I, I would agree. And, you know, other, other nutrients that are easy to replenish are things like magnesium. So we tend to be deficient in magnesium and low magnesium is associated with both depression and anxiety. So that's a relatively easy um, supplement to discuss with your doctor. Um, you know, and then there are also um, food lists that you can go to from the book. But I, but I know you have, a, you have a, a lot of people with questions. So yes, yes. I, I don't want to, I don't want to talk too much. <laughs> No, it, it, this is great. Thank you. You're, you're, you, you come from a place of wisdom and not just knowledge, and that's critically important. Uh, when I lost power, we were talking about um, chocolate, and most of uh, our followers have heard me say this, but for those that haven't heard it before, um, I think you should have a little chocolate every day the highest quality dark chocolate you can get, but don't let it touch your teeth. You take a square of the best dark chocolate you can get and put it in your mouth, but don't let it touch your teeth. Just let it dissolve. It takes two to three minutes to dissolve. In the meantime, you're tasting the chocolate and it's the oral thalamic tract that you're getting a message up to your brain that says, chocolate's here. Chocolate. Immediately start, makes people happy. <laughs> it makes people happy. You start producing those endorphins and encephalons that are so much more powerful than morphine. You know, and you have that feel good. Feel and good if, feeling, yes. And if you need another square, have another square. I've never had a patient have more than two squares yeah. because they're saturated. And that's yes. a way of having chocolate every day. 
That, that's awesome. I love that. And it's also, there's something, there's a mindful element about it too. You know, yes. there's, a, there's a way in which you savor that. And yeah. I think that sometimes, you know, we see a piece of chocolate and we're excited at the end of a meal or at the end of a day, and we kind of just chomp on it. And it's true, you know, you, you almost miss the experience of it. And I yes. think that's a, a very big uh, component of sort of eating and, and uh, trying, to, trying to make some, I, I love that, and make some healthy habit changes. That's, that's very important. And I've noticed there are times when I've done this that I'm so frustrated, I just want to chew and swallow. And I want more, right. I want to chew and swallow. That's but, it. Yeah, but, but isn't that the way the with mouth. that's right? Is, isn't that the way when we're rushing through a meal? Yes. And then suddenly we have eaten our meal and we're still hungry. And I find that when I'm stressed, that can happen. And I'm, it's always a reminder to me that um, I'm rushing through and I'm not giving my, my body a chance to absorb the, um, you know, the nutrients or anything like that. That brings up a really good question. I, I think it's a good question. Uh, we've often heard that there's a 20 minute delay between the time that your body actually is saturated with food mm -hmm. and when you feel full, mm -hmm. that there is that delay. Have you looked into that to see where does that come from? Why so, is, is that a mistake in nature? So, you know, it's interesting. I haven't necessarily looked at the research on that, but I know a few things about satiety. Um, so, one of, one of the things is that um, when our hunger hormones are disrupted, they can be disrupted by things like stress and poor sleep. And that's one of the things that throws off our cycle in our body. So the, the hunger hormones, um, ghrelin being one of them, the hormones that, that help us decide that we're full. They get, they, they get out of whack for one of a nicer, nicer term. And when they do that, we, can't, we don't realize that we're full and we continue eating. So that type of disruption in poor sleep or whatever is driving that poor sleep can then disrupt how we eat. So that's, that's one thing that I find, um, certainly my patients, the people I speak to find helpful to know. So if they're sleeping poorly, they want to start to correct that. Um, and the second thing is that often, if someone is feeling hungry at a certain point, and I'll say to them, have a half a glass of water because there's an interaction between the thirst center and the hunger center and they're very close by. So, so having, that, having your thirst satiated can actually help you stave off the hunger, then you, know, you might be ready to eat in a half hour. I'm not saying skip your meal, just, just do it that way. Oh, that's really interesting, thank you. Um, you may have answered this question while I was off from Mark, uh, he asked about FODMAPs. Did did that question come so, up? So we didn't we didn't really touch on that. So you know, I I um, my feeling about FODMAPs is that it's probably something I, I have no. Uh, I, I I personally didn't look at the research on FODMAPs. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a I think it's an appropriate um, use of a diet if if you have those conditions. I know that gastroenterologists tend to be um, you know tend to think it can be very helpful. And I, I would say, Dr. Tom, as with anyone who walks into my office, if they come and saying, I eat a keto diet, or they come and saying, I eat a carnivore diet, or I eat this type of diet, I have to really, as a psychiatrist, try to work with them where they're at. So I'm not at all, I think FODMAPS is, is, works very well for people who, my, my, I, my guidance to, to an individual is, like I mentioned earlier when we spoke about anxiety, if you emit a certain food and you're feeling less anxious, that's huge information for you. So sometimes it's about finding that balance. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, there's no diet that's right for everyone. There's no exactly. food selection program that's right for everyone and it's a trial and error. Mark asked, uh, how do I know if I have a FODMAP sensitivity? And Mark, there is a technology now in laboratory medicine called silicone chip technology. And a number of papers have come out that have referred to it, Mayo Clinic referred to it as a new era in laboratory medicine because it's 97 to 99% sensitive and 98 to 100% specific. And we've never seen numbers like that before mm -hmm. in laboratory medicine. And they put together different panels. It's a blood draw. And the panels are called zoomers because you zoom in on the problem. There's the wheat zoomer. It's the most comprehensive test in the world. That's one that I know a lot about. Yes, yeah. 
identify a wheat related disorder and there's dairy zoomer, egg zoomer, nut zoomer, and there's a FODMAP zoomer, zoomer, lectin zoomer. So you can identify if there are certain foods high in FODMAPs that you may be sensitive to with confidence that it's a highly accurate test. We have information on those tests on our website, thedr.com, and you can download the information and take it to your doctor and say, would, would you look into this test, please, to see if it's appropriate for me? Because right. I really think when I eat certain foods, I don't feel so good. Mm -hmm. So could, could we look into this test? And that's a way that you can address this. So let's see what we have for questions. Um, People are saying uh, uh, hello, hello from New Zealand. Gwendolyn's in New Zealand. <laughs> Hi, Gwendolyn. Annie's in Ontario, Canada. Um, Carolina asks, what helps with vitamin absorption? Well, um, I'll start the answer. No, no, please do, please do. And then yeah. let Dr. Uma continue. Uh, but reducing the amount of inflammation in your intestines will enhance absorption. You can be eating the very best food in the world but if you have a lot of inflammation in your intestines, maybe your microbiome's way out of balance from years of eating the wrong foods and you've cleaned up the foods, but the microbiome is still out of balance and you get some GI symptoms, some gut symptoms. But steps to reduce inflammation often will help with absorption of the nutrients. Mm -hmm. Dr. Uma, do you wanna to add to that? I think that's a perfect explanation, honestly, because I was going to say, I was going to say something along those lines of the healing of the gut sometimes takes much longer, even if we've corrected our diet, we have to allow the gut time to heal. Um, mm -hmm. So I would just ask people to be patient with that process. Uh, don't, don't give up on the, on the healthy habits that you employ, because it may just take time for the gut to heal. And that there is, um, I think in our Facebook Live a couple of weeks ago, if you go back, for those that are interested, I took about 15 minutes and went through how to rebuild a healthy microbiome, the number of steps in it, eating root vegetables, eating fermented vegetables, making fresh applesauce. Uh, but th this is a good one for everyone. I'll just give you this one part of it because yeah. it's so useful. Uh, we know that uh, one of the arguably most important enzymes in the gut is called intestinal alkaline phosphatase. And IAP does so many things for you. It helps to stabilize your blood sugar and insulin sensitivity goes up. It lowers total cholesterols if they're too high. It lowers total triglycerides and it reduces the toxic crud um, that, that gets into your bloodstream called metabolic endotoxemia by 73% when you increase your IAP levels. And what increases IAP levels? The pectin from applesauce. This is why an apple a day keeps the doctor away, <laughs> is that you take about five, six, or 10 apples, as many as you want, always organic, because apples are on uh, the top of the list, the top three or four of the dirty dozen of uh, being the highest concentration right. of chemicals. So always get organic, wash them, but don't peel them. Dice them up, get rid of the seeds, but use the rest of the apples, put them in a pot, add water to about one third the height of the apples in the pot, about one third. Add some cinnamon, maybe a couple of raisins, a little turmeric if you want, turn it on high, let it boil 10, 12 minutes. Take a look in the pot. When you see a shine on the skin of the apples, you've released the pectin from the meat and from the skin, so it's on the surface. And it's readily available in the small intestine. So you, and you have an, a tablespoon, couple tablespoons a day of this fresh applesauce, you increase intestinal alkaline phosphatase mm which does so much to help heal your gut. It's not complete by itself, but it's a really strong tool that helps with all the other healthy habits that you do. That's excellent, love that. Okay, let's see what we have here. Uh, Kat says, I eat a whole bar of dark chocolate. Well, Kat, we need to talk. We need to <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kate says, Thanks and blessings from White Mills. 
Pennsylvania. So glad and grateful to be here to learn from you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mark says, thanks for touching on FODMAP question. I'm in your week Zoomer study. Great, Mark. Very glad to hear it. And Mark then wrote, when eating chocolate, do you think there are some distinct advantages to eating 80 to 90% chocolate versus 70%? Dr. Uma, do you, you have some information on yeah. that? Yeah, so usually I say to people above 70% are usually a, a, are usually a good choice. And, and um, here, I, when I do lectures and stuff, I have certain uh, brands and I'll show photographs of that I think people might like. But um, the, the darker, the better for a couple of reasons. A natural chocolate is not, uh, is not as processed. And the reason is that it allows the antioxidants to be, the flavonols and antioxidants to be at a higher level. So for example, people who bake and use Dutch processed cocoa, you know, bakers and chefs will use Dutch processed cocoa because it actually sweetens and lightens the taste and there's less bitterness to the cocoa. And it is, it's perfectly fine for limited baking. But if you're really looking for your antioxidant boost from that, you really want to get a more natural, unprocessed type of cocoa. So the darker, the better. And um, the second thing is it also has less sugar of any added sugars, which is better for you. And the third thing is that it's a fermented food. Um, so that actually helps your gut in a in an additional way. It's the process of how the chocolate is made. You know, um, can I just say to everyone how privileged it is that for us to be here listening to Dr. Uma, that this is the director of nutritional and lifestyle psychiatry at Mass General at Harvard. She's the director. And what is she spewing out right now? All of the benefits of the best dark chocolate that you could get, right? and using turmeric, which just validates the critical importance that food is medicine. Absolutely. And that the more you dive into, a little bit at a time, but always learning a little bit more about your food as your medicine, the healthier you're gonna be. So uh, it's just such a privilege to have you on today. And I just wanna make a, one more comment um, about your book. When I came back on, I heard that you were talking with Mary Agnes about the book. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> she was um, great. She was, any... was a wonderful film and we missed you, but she was awesome too. It was lovely to see her. Oh, marvelous, marvelous. Thank you. Um, if you get this book for the price of one bad pizza, <laughs> I love that analogy. I thought that was, I thought that was excellent. I'm... Yes, yes. <laughs> And you get one, I, you, you just open the book. You know, I've said this about my books. Get either of my books, open it to any page, read one paragraph. If you don't like it, don't buy the book, mm -hmm. right? And I'm sure with Dr. Uma's book, it's the same thing. Open it up to any page and you're gonna get a pearl that's going to help guide you in your choices of the foods that you eat. Any page. And, you know, um, in my books, I say, you know, if you don't like the book, just email me at info at the doctor.com. We'll give you a refund, you know, and I'm not suggesting you do that, Dr. Uma, but you know, I feel that strongly that, that, you, that there's something you can share. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. One concept, one concept. And, uh, um, uh, the, uh, in many of my presentations, I'll show this slide. Mm -hmm. um, it's a display in the Museum of Science in Florence. Mm -hmm. It's a marble stand, round stand with a glass dome. And inside the glass dome is Galileo's finger. And Galileo bequeathed that all of his inventions could be on display for all of posterity, as long as they also displayed his finger. And I show that, you know, because doctors, uh, you know, I say, you know, I've sat where you are so many times over the years, so many seminars and so many symposiums. And if the speaker is a good speaker, my pen is flying across the page. Mm -hmm. Read this book, order this study, try this nutrient, look at this food, page after page after page. And I get back to my practice on, Mon and on Monday morning and there's no time to implement anything. You know, all of the pages of information, there's no so time. Right. So I came up with the concept for myself. If there's one thing that I remember, just one thing mm -hmm. out of that weekend symposium or seminar where I paid mm -hmm. thousands of dollars and flew 
wherever it was, away from my family, out of my practice, if there's one thing that I implement for the rest of my professional career, mm -hmm. that seminar was worthwhile. That's a great rule. I love it. Mm -hmm. I wish I could remember 10 things, you know, right. but I'm not that right. smart. If I get one, it's great. And that's how it is with a good book. Mm -hmm. You get one pearl mm -hmm. out of the whole book mm -hmm. that you use for the rest of your life. It costs you 20 bucks. And for the rest of your life, you know, there's one thing that's that is just you part of who you are. And you do. Yeah. That's I, right. I, I agree. That's I, I love that concept. I, I really do because I too have, you know, gone and not been able to absorb the hours of information that I know are so valuable. But yeah. I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna follow that. I, I totally agree. It's you know, what, oh, what wow. can you take away? Yeah, I love oh, that role. Yeah. And so with Dr. Uma's book, I would not have her on here unless this was a class book that's going to be impactful in your life. She's the director of nutritional and lifestyle psychiatry at Harvard. What more do you need for credibility, right? Spend the 20 bucks, order the book, open it up. And if there's not, you know, if you don't get one thing out of it, I'd be very embarrassed. Write me and let me know. But I am so sure that you will. And the last point that I'll make on that about Galileo's finger, <laughs> it happened to be his middle finger. It was Galileo's last message to the church because he had been suppressed his whole life, right? And there's books on Amazon called Galileo's Finger. There's a couple of books and you can read the story how this brilliant man could not carry his information out to the world, right? Wow. But I like the idea if there's one thing, one yeah. thing, Absolutely. Those, you know, we always think of our clinical pearls, you know, so, something that you can, you can use, you can implement all the time. So no, yes. thank you. I, uh... well, with that, you know, folks, our hour is up. It's been, it goes so fast, especially it does. for it, it flew by. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. And Dr. Uma Nadun, thank you so much for your work and your pioneering work. You founded this department there at general and thank you for carrying this message out into the world that food is medicine and impacts on our brain function thank you so very much thank you so much dr thomas it was such a pleasure to talk with you and thanks for having me and for supporting the book such a pleasure okay everyone we'll see you next week same time same place thank you bye, -bye.